All right, I'm Jim Mundorf. This is Lonesome Lands, Episode 2 podcast. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening to the first one, if you did, and big thanks to everybody that shared it. But in the first one, I talked a lot about stories and kind of, the, I think, what people think of as podcasts is you sit down with somebody and you have your conversation or you tell your story that way. Um, and that I am planning on doing that. I'd like to do interviews. But I'd also like to do... Um, what I'm going to do right now, which is sit down and just talk about an issue that I think is important and people aren't really um, paying attention to in agriculture. And that is what I think is the biggest scam in all of agriculture, which is the beef checkoff. And as far as the story goes, it's kind of a story of greed mainly and manipulation and corruption and, and all that stuff. But... um so to get started, what is the checkoff? If you don't know, um, cattle producers, anytime an animal is sold, one dollar is taken out of the check. Uh, one dollar per head is taken out of the check of cattle producers, and it goes into the checkoff. And if you ask a cattle producer what that is, they'll say, "Well, it's it's beef. It's what's for dinner advertisements, or or something like that." But the really very few people really know where that money goes. And, um, so, and it's a law, uh, it was, it's part of the beef act and order is what it's called. And so what it's supposed to be used for, according to the beef act is to enable cattle producers to establish finance and carry out a coordinated program of research, producer and consumer information and promotion to improve, maintain and develop markets for cattle, beef and beef products. Um, and the main thing to think about there develop markets for cattle, beef, and beef products. I think that's going to surprise a lot of people who are familiar with the checkoff because there has never been any sort of development of a market for cattle um, from from beef checkoff funds. It's always beef and beef products, and the reason for that is because the people who control the checkoff are corporate beef packers who, who just want to improve their bottom line they don't really care about the cattle side of it. Um, and so how does it all work? And the best description um, of this, a, a guy who worked on the the Checkout Beef Board, who I did a video, it's probably been a couple of years back now, it's Vaughn Meyer. He, he described it as um, a money laundering shell game. And, and so that's kind of, that's the best description I've ever heard. And so I'm going to try to explain the shell game because this is the way scams work best are um, if you if you can't understand them. And if nobody can figure them out, well, then it just keeps going. And so I'm actually going to try to draw this out, how this goes. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. But I'll also try to explain it as clearly as I can. Um and so the dollar ahead, so if you have a dollar, you sell old Bessie at the sale barn, and you got your dollar up here, where does that go? And so your dollar first goes through your state ag department, I believe, that's what a sale barn guy told me, that he writes a check to the state ag department, and they send it on to the state beef council. There's uh, 43 of them, because some of the, the states out, in the Northeast aren't big enough to, to really have any, there's no point in having a state beef council because the number of cattle sold, there just isn't enough. And so that dollar goes to one of the 43 state beef council offices. And that state beef council gives 50 cents. So some states actually charge a $1.50. Uh, Iowa charges $1.50. North Dakota charges $2. Some other states can charge $2. But it's by law they have to charge at least a dollar, and then fifty cents goes to the checkoff beef board over here. Um, and so out of that fifty cents, and <clears throat> what they do with it is it goes through their process. And I've been crunching numbers for the last few days and went through all, everything I could that, to show where the money went. And 80% of the money that is currently under contract through the checkoff beef board goes to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. 
who they are is an association that represents uh, beef packers and corporate cattle feeders, and they pretend to represent all cattle feeders in the U.S., or all cattle producers in the U.S., um, but the little guy they don't really do much for, the smaller independent family farmers and ranchers, um, they kind of, they actually work against, and I'm going to get into that and, and explain how that all works. Um, and so that's your 50 cents. And if we go back, it's easier to do a dollar to start with so because your 50 cents goes to check out beef board. So the other 50 cents, where does that go? Well, the state beef councils can also send it to what is called the Federation of State Beef Councils. And um, in my state, the biggest expense of our state beef council, Iowa State Beef Council, is sending money to the Federation of State Beef Councils. Um, why they do that is still, you know, who knows? But what the Federation of State Beef Councils is, is actually a division of, it says that right on the website, this is a division, which is the NCBA website. This is a division of the NCBA. So they're actually just giving money directly to the, the NCBA. And so all of that money, uh, 9.1 million last year, directly to the NCBA. And that's your checkoff dollar. And that doesn't go through any approval, I don't believe. I've looked through all these authorization requests. And I'll talk about how that works, too. Um, but then, so what is the rest of it? Like 16% goes there. And then the other part of it goes to state... I know I write like a third grader. State and national, and it's even harder I like this way, programs. So that's where the rest of it goes to. So for your state program, who does that go to? Well, most states have, um, like Iowa has Ad Iowa Cattlemen's Association, Nebraska and Nebraska Cattlemen's Association. And those are affiliates of um, NCBA. They're in the affiliate program. So the money isn't going directly to NCBA, but NCBA definitely has a say over it. For example, Iowa had a bill that they were trying to get through called the 5014 bill. Iowa Cattlemen's was for it. NCBA was against it. Iowa Cattlemen's went to the National Convention and came home, and we haven't heard anything from Iowa Cattlemen's about 5014 since. I don't believe. At least I haven't. Um, and so that's your state programs, your national programs. Guess where that goes? NCBA. But we don't really know because no one really, uh, it's not really, some of these, you can find this stuff on the annual reports from your state beef council. And there are as vague as, as you can get. Um, Nebraska actually just uses abbreviations for everything of where the money goes. Um, and, and they make it. They don't make it real crystal clear, which which has them looking pretty guilty. So if you go back to this and you want to put in, so I did that for a dollar, but if you put in the total amount here, um, the checkout brings in around eighty million dollars a year. I'm getting my my writing's getting even worse. Um, and so you got fifty per, fifty percent of that. You got forty million going over here, um, and then. You say NCBA has under contract around 50, um, the total is around 70 million through authorized contracts. NCBA has around 55 million of that. That's 80% of that under contract. So you're saying, well, how do you have that? You're going from 40 million to 70 million. Well, NCBA has $34.4 million in three year contracts. Um, and so they like to they like to divvy it out by year, and they'll say, "Well, we're not spending eighty percent. We don't take eighty percent of it. Because if you break it down by year, they are only taking seventy percent of it." But then, if you throw in this nine point one, getting to where I can't even write anymore, um, million from the FSBC, then you're back up to seventy five percent. So, but the point is, you know, when you can't afford 
what you want to spend your money on, you you take out a payment payment plan. And so we're on the three year payment plan with NCBA because they want to they want to lock that money in for three years. Those are research contracts. Um, I'll get into what those talk about. But so you got fifty five million here. You got nine point one million here, and then this all depends on your state and Nash your state how they divvy it up. Um, but when you talk about a shell game, like you see where the money is and you see where the vast majority of it ends up, it's all the same place. What is the point? Like this is, there's 43 state beef council offices uh, with full-time employees. So this is a fully staffed office. Checkoff Beef Board has a fully staffed office. A uh, federal state beef council, I believe, has a or Federation of State Beef Councils, I believe, has a fully staffed office. All these state affiliates, uh, like Iowa, has full time employees for their um, for their in their offices. So there's another probably 43 to 45 state affiliates, um, fully staffed offices. All these employees, um, and it makes no sense unless you're trying to hide money. Like I'm, I don't know how money laundering works. I've I've watched Ozark and I still don't know how it works. But I know they're trying to clean it, and they 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 send it through as many channels as they can to try to clean it. And so, um, this looks like they're trying to clean it <laughs> to me, or at least confuse everyone to the point where you don't know where it's going. Um, and so how where does it go? Like the money goes somewhere, right? Like it's eighty million dollars. Where does it go? And so the best way to figure that out is authorization. I'm kind of jammed in here now. Authorization requests. And if you go to um, the Federation site, which is the NCBA site, they have these list. Feder they have these authorization requests listed. And um, so I went to the first one. The first one's uh, consumer information authorization request. And that's the. There's like five different um, categories. And so the first one you re you'll come across will be Northeast Beef Promotion. And that is a promotional program where they, because there's not a lot of cattle in the Northeast, they, they set aside money specifically for the Northeast. Uh, I think they said I-95, which I'm going to assume is like New York, Boston, those areas where beef needs to be promoted um, and, and people don't really have a lot of knowledge about it. And so they pay um, $550,000 goes to that program. And then the next one up is Farm Bureau. And they have a school program where they get information about beef into schools. They get $900,000. And then you come to the NCBA part of the consumer information, and they get $6,020,000. Uh, $6, uh, yeah, $6,020,000. For thought leader outreach, and this is their authorization request. Twenty-two pages of just complete and total BS. Um, in their AR purpose and description, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, working in conjunction with state beef council partners, to develop three-year strategy to ensure they are conducting work that aligns with the beef industry long-range plan. I mean, it just goes on and on, and it's just drivel and platitudes and just. I'm, I try to read it, I, but my brain shuts off at some point when you're reading. Just It's like a junior hire who is given, uh, you know, you have to have a certain number of words or a certain number of pages, and, and they have filled them out, out kind of in a similar way. Um, and so they get $6 million where the Northeast Beef Promotion gets uh, 550 thousand and so in total of these authorization requests like i said there's 70 million dollars going into them uh, 80 percent of that uh, currently under contract goes to the ncba um and nine point so the federation of state beef council how do we follow that money and that is kind of impossible i think but because in these authorization quests it is a funding from other research, and then it will on NCBAs it will say not available. On the all the other ones it will say 
none that they they're not getting funding from other research on NCBAs it says NA not available and so then you go to where they're um, there they show how much money they got the year before and so the funds awarded to NCBA from federal state and beef council the year before 2.439 million dollars that's what they got the year before and there's no funds available from this year or it's that's not available for what they're spending this year um i don't know why that is but i'm pretty sure it's because and I, I, so Dave Wright is another guy who say worked on the checkoff beef board, and he did a presentation where he talked about NCBA getting 100 percent of all of the Federation of State Beef Councils money. And from what I can see, there's one authorization quest, request where they get um, last year they got seven million. I think it's a, one of the three year ones, but it, but they got seven million from just for one authorization request straight from federal's their own division, which is the Federation State Beef Council. So they're really just paying themselves. Um, and so how does this happen, right? Like who is supposed to over, you know, like what is the checkoff beef board? And so the checkoff beef board is 101 members and they're na nominated by state cattle organizations. So if you go back to our little shell game here, um, your state cattle organization, like in Iowa, would be Iowa Cattlemen's Organi uh, Association, which is an affiliate of NCBA. And so they nominate people who agree with them. Um, I, there's been people who have worked hard to get on the checkoff beef board who are not NCBA people, and they, have, they care a lot about it, and they want to change it. Uh, I've already mentioned a couple. But... <clears throat> one of you know i just talked to one the other day i said how many people do you think are ncba members on the checkout b board he said at least 90 percent um and so these people go to two meetings a year w one of them is the national uh, is ncba's national convention and so they it was this year it was new, in new orleans so they get pretty much two free vacations they get flown down there and put up so that they can go to these meetings and then they get put on committees and, and every other thing. But it, what it really is, um, the next one is in San Diego. So they'll be flying out to San Diego and spending a couple of days on the beach. And, and NCBA people, these are lobbyists who are paid to influence people. And so they have these ranchers and farmers coming out there. I feel like it's probably pretty easy pickings to get them uh, you know, I mean, they're, they tell them how wonderful they are and how wonderful a job the checkoff is doing and, and how great everything is and, and great work and see you next year. And so this happens for, you know, and then those people, they, they go back to their county cattlemen's association, their state cattlemen's association. They talk about how wonderful NCBA is and how ev wonderful everything's going. And so that gets done for years and years, and now we end up, we have there is a lot of cattle producers in the U.S. who really just kind of have their heads up NCBA's ass because this whole thing is, has been going on, and nobody's really explained it or, or looked through it. I mean, there's definitely been people who have, but I feel like we're getting to a point where this information can become more shareable, and maybe we'll have a chance to actually fix things. Um, but I asked one of the checkout beef board members, that I was talking to, I said, so do you ever, like, do you do anything? And he says, well, we get on committees and we talk about how the money's getting spent. And I was like, but, but as far as accomplish anything, do you do anything? And he was like, well, no, not really. <laughs> and so to me, that's just like, they go to these meetings and, and I said to him, and I was like, you know, you were there to try to change things. And I've talked to a number of them and they were all like, it was a total waste of time. Um, these people who have fought this checkoff are, are, just exhausted and they've been doing it for years and years um and so a really good example i have this book it's called a buck ahead and it was written by um lisa Zelinsky and diane i'm gonna screw it up G gumar gumar <laughs> not good with names but um lisa was a journalist and covered the beef checkoff for a long time and was just kind of fed up with with the runaround that she's gotten and never gotten a straight answer. And, and you can, you get the gist of it if you read the book and Diane actually worked for the checkoff beat board. I said they had a fully funded 
or, you know, they have all their full-time employees. She was one of them for 15 years. And she ended up writing this book, Buck Ahead, Did Greed, Envy, and Thirst for Power, Hijack Beef Research and Promotion. So in the book, um, one of the beef board members wrote the introduction um, who had served on the beef board, and he, Leo McDonald. And he said, when I, um, just talking about serving on the beef board and, and trying to, to break down these numbers that I just showed you. And he said, when I asked to see a breakdown of NCBA's implementation cost, I was told that I that was not done at the committee level as only the performances and contractual duties of the actual contract were up for discussion. As a beef board member, I noted to the committee that it was our duty to oversee the $1 collected, not just part of it. In response, I was told that that was the operating committee's duty. Um, and so, again, not uh, – he wasn't able to do anything, and he was told it's the operating committee's duty. Well, there's a member that – there's another part in here where an – one guy actually got onto the operating committee. And to go back um, to our shell game here, what I left out, one of them I left out, is the Beef Promotion Operating Committee. And they are right here. And so everyone is told that the checkoff beef board controls the checkoff, but they don't. They can't really, like I said, they can't do anything. The Beef Promotion Operating Committee are the ones who really control the checkoff, and, and they authorize the money in these in these uh, authorization requests and so who is that that is a 20 person panel and 10 of the people are nominated by the federation of state beef councils which i've already said that is the ncba um and then the other 10 are nominated by the checkoff beef board members the 101 checkoff beef board members who i've been told at least 90% of them are all NCBA members um, and died in the wool followers. Um, and so another uh, – so it's how things work on the Beef Operating Committee. Chuck Kiker from Beaumont, Texas, um, he was a two-term Beef Board member and Operating Committee member. And he says, trying to question an NCBA implementation AR was like headbutting a wall. The 10 members of the operating committee from the Federation side are well vetted for loyalty to NCBA long before they get to the operating committee, leaving only four NCBA bi biased votes needed on the beef board side to fund any AR. Meanwhile, NCBA has around $80 million budget, over 170 employees, and a lot of influence in Washington, D.C. So how is NCBA so dependent on the beef checkoff? More than 70% of everything NCBA does is checkoff, which means more than 70% of NCBA's overhead is paid with checkoff dollars. All of NCBA's administrative staff, salaries, the CEO, CFO, and others are subsidized by checkoff dollars. Um... And so that gives you an idea of how things work on the operating committee. If you are trying to do something that, you know, the other nominated NCBA members don't want done, it's like headbutting a wall. Um, and, uh, you know, the he also talks about how the if any authorization question that's not from NCBA, they'll haggle over a $50,000 one where they'll just see a, one from NCBA that's six million dollars and it's instantly approved. And to go back, um, well they they talked about implementation costs, and that's one thing also on Dave Wright's presentation that he talked about. And imp and so on these ARs, there's implementation and direct costs. They're broken down. And for the direct costs, they have they have to kind of give a excuses of where they're where they're using their money, like. Um, that one I was talking about, their thought leader AR, which they're getting six six million dollars for. Um, you know, their thought leaders are can pretty much just be their buddies, but they have to write down, you know, what they're who these thought, you know, that they're giving money to these thought leaders that are experts in their field or whatever. Um, but as far as the implementation fee, that cannot be looked into, like Leo. He, said he cannot look into it and the other quote said we don't look into ncba's 
uh, finances. So it really isn't looked into. And one thing I found really interesting was um, NCB like this, the the one I already went into about consumer information and their thought leader authorization request. Their direct costs were $2.2 million. Their implementation was $3.759 million. So you have... You know, you have to give an excuse of how you're spending your 2.2 million, but your 3.7 is not looked into at all um, by either Checkout Beat Board or the uh, promotion or the operating committee. And so they really just get to do whatever they want with that. And um, so I looked at, you know, $14 million goes to eight other contractors. You know, one of them was Farm Bureau. I talked about the uh, Northeast. Well, the, I talked about the other one, the Northeast uh, Beef Promotion. And so there's a number of other ones. And, and that e- I equaled, added all them up, it equaled $14 million. And I looked at the difference between implementation and direct cost. And implement, um, they're diff- they were spending about 26% on implementation uh, in the, out of that $14 million. And if you go to NCBA's implementation versus direct cost, they are almost perfectly 50 50 26 million in each um so they are they have pretty much half of their money is in a area that doesn't ever get looked at um and so where does that money go where do, you know like i said it has to go somewhere and usda is supposed to be overseeing them um but if you think USDA has any problem with corporate corruption, then you're just not paying attention because they are in on it. Um, they're pretty much partnered up. USDA gave the NCBA, I think, $145,000 back in January or February so that NCBA would promote their uh, mandatory electronic ID rule. Um, and they said it's to promote traceability in cattle, but it's just really to push these uh, electronic ID tags on cattle people. So really they're partners, and, and I don't think they really care about where that money is going. But, you know, according to the Chuck Kleiker quote, more than 70% of NCBA's overhead is paid for with checkoff dollars. All of NCBA's administrative staff salaries, the CEO, CFO, and others are subsidized by checkoff dollars. And so he's talking about NCBA has a massive Washington, D.C. office. Uh, I talked to uh, someone who lobbies for or works for another ag organization, and they were they didn't really know my opinion on NCBA. And they were like, wow, they really have a nice office. They knew I was in the beef and the cattle deal. And I, and I was like, really? And they explained how there's a rooftop patio and a, it's the nicest office they were in t- there at in dc they have a rooftop patio with a bar and a kitchen up there and i mean it's it sounds insane and and this checkoff dollars goes to fund that um and so i was also told they have a staff of uh, close to 90 lobbyists that are there in dc and i said earlier this is the biggest scam because they are what makes this the biggest scam i think and and kind of just mind blowing is that they use this money to lobby against the needs of the cattle producer. Um, I've over the last three years, I've listened to more Senate hearings than I can even remember. And they've all been about, you know, good bills that would help the cattle producer. And none of them have passed. They've all failed because there's always an NCBA person there who is shooting them down and talking about how they actually represent the voice of the cattlemen, and they don't want anything to change. No more, no new regulations. Um, The first Senate hearing I heard, I sat down and watched, and they brought in this uh, guy, NCBA brought up their cattle rancher from Kansas, and when he started talking, I instantly thought, this guy sounds like he owns a beef packing company. You know, he was just given all these excuses about how the market, market operates, and so I looked him up, and he's actually the chair of the board of a company that owns 15% of national beef packing, um, the fourth largest beef packer in the country. And so 
Um, I also looked at who else was on the board, and the secretary of the board of that company was uh, the president, the current president, or the the president at the time of the NCBA. And that company had not only just a few years ago was the majority owner of of the beef packing of National Beef, um, and so that kind of is how it goes. They NCBA says they're the voice of the cattlemen. They're constantly on Capitol Hill telling all these politicians that they are the voice of the cattlemen, and they're saying that the cattle, you know, that they're partnered up with the beef packers and and they both want the same thing. Um, mandatory country of origin labeling. No one has won it, has fought harder against that. Um, there's a lot of cattle people who want a an a country of origin label on the beef packages so that consumers can tell where the beef comes from. NCBA has fought tooth and nail to get that removed and to keep it removed. Right now there is a bill, uh, Beef Labeling Act, I think, something like that, that's in uh, that's been introduced, and NCBA is fighting against it. They were actually a group. Um, when they got this removed, they were part of a group of a bunch of um, beef industry you know, beef packing industry people. And they put out a statement that said, in short, beef is beef, whether the steer or heifer was born in Montana, Manitoba, or Mazat- Mazatlan. Um, and so that's their stance. Um, beef is beef no matter where it's born. And that is what the cattle producer has to sit back and listen to and know that their dollars are going to fund these kind of statements, um, you look back at the Beef Act and how they talked about developing uh, cattle markets. And I said they're actually working against that. That is the Prime Act. Um, Thomas Massey has introduced this in the House. I think it's been introduced in the Senate also. And it is an act that would deregulate, take away some of the regulations um, that make it really hard for ranchers to sell their beef directly to the consumer. And um, their their regulations on your local locker, these small lockers that that will pro, um, process cattle for for ranchers, and then the ranchers can sell it directly to a consumer. But there's they're more regulated than the beef packers in Brazil. They have to have constant in USDA inspections, um, or so, an inspector has to be there constantly. Where in other countries, the USDA inspector stops by every couple years, um, and so it's it's actually harder for American cattle producers to sell their beef direct to consumers than it is for beef uh, than for is for people in Brazil. Um, and NCBA has against it. They have come out with statements against it, and I'm sure they're knocking on doors over there telling them that. They're the voice of the cattlemen, and the cattlemen actually want more regulation on, or you know, want to keep these regulations on the on their local lockers. And the thing of it is, they're all against any sort of market regulation, cattle market regulation. But they're all for the regulation. You know, they talk talk about how they're free market people, and and they don't want any regulations. But they're all for this USDA regulations on your local le- meat lockers. And the reason for that is because it would hurt beef packers. Um, I don't know how much, you know, it'd be probably a drop in the bucket, but anything that's going to hurt beef packers, NCBA is against. Um, And so you look at all this money that's went through the checkoff over the years, and you have to ask yourself, has it done any good at all? Um, The Beef It's What's for Dinner ad campaign was developed in 1992 that was before ncba even existed before then they were nca and the people i think it was uh american meat institute or meat council something like that they actually paid an advertising agency leo burnett advertising agency who came up with pillsbury doughboy they came up with marlboro man and they came up with beef it's what's for dinner and we've now been using that slogan and NCBA takes full credit, and they say they're, um, you know, they're running it out everywhere. But that slogan had absolutely nothing to do with NCBA. And if you look at what has happened to beef numbers and cattle numbers since the checkoff has been instituted, um, Dave Hyde 
is a cattle guy who wrote an op-ed recently, and he said um, it was called uh, A Billion Dollars in a Flat Iron Steak, something like that. I probably got it wrong. But um, his point was there's been a billion dollars collected through the years for the beef checkoff, and their number one talking point is they developed this flat iron steak, which they're able to export more. And you get into these export and import numbers and what that has really done for the cattle industry. You know, they've they've talked a lot about how they've increased these export numbers over the last eight years, but that hasn't helped cattle prices at all. Um, the only thing that's helped the cattle prices are, or the herd is completely shrunk now, and, and so now they're back up. But um, in Dave Hyde's article, he wrote, Since 1985, the checkoff's first year, the cattle industry has lost 43% of its independent family producers, losing 15,000 every year. 7 million mother cows and 75% of independent cattle feeders in the United States. Since 1985, the producer's share of beef dollar has shrunk from 60% to 37%, and average annual beef consumption has fallen from 80 pounds to 57.8 pounds in 2022. And so if you look at pretty much any uh, measurable metric, the beef checkoff has been an abject failure um, as far as increasing demand or increasing cattle prices. Um you know, you look at 75% of independent cattle feeders. In, in my last podcast, I talk about how there was 300 head, 300 head feedlot about every section when I was a kid growing up all throughout the Midwest. And um, those are all gone now. Those those cattle that were once that would, would be in those feedlots are, are sitting in gigantic corporate feed yards that hold 10,000, 20,000, you know, um, the I just read Cactus Feeders is one is one of the big corporate feed yards that was all behind this checkoff deal, and um, their CEO was the chair of the Federation of State Beef Checkoffs just a, a little while ago, and they they feed out six hundred thousand head. Uh, there's another company that feeds out a million head, and a lot of the people running those companies are just suits in offices. They're not, um, you know, they're not what you think of as when you think of the cattle business as far as you know, as far as I, th- I'm concerned, um, but you think about that 75 percent of independent cattle feeders, that, and for the cow calf guys, that'd be 75 percent more bidders. What it's done is really just taken away the competition in, in, out of the open market. Um, can you imagine 75 more guys, 75 percent more bidders on your calves when you take them, um, or more people wanting to buy your calves? That would, I think the cow calf guys would like that. Um, but then you look at 15,000 independent family producers and that's where it kind of, I like that. I like how he put that independent family producers because a lot of these producers that ha- are no longer exist. Um, it was a family deal and, and it's not just, you know, if you're a corporate guy, you probably look at that and just think, well, sorry, that guy lost his job, but it's not just a guy. It's, it's his kids and it's his, um, you know, there's cousins and, and grandkids and aunts and uncles, and the whole thing is, is really just a family deal. Um, and uh, a lot of people talk about privilege. That's like a big thing. I'm, I'm supposed to be the most privileged class, but I think I'm more privileged than, than anybody because I was able to grow up on a, uh, around livestock. I think that's the in America, you know, I think that's the biggest privilege anybody has uh and it's it's really hard to put into words. Um and it it just sucks to see those numbers, you know, 15,000 a year are gone and people who no longer have that privilege uh and so you start thinking about what can be done and really uh what should be done, you know, is these guys be rounded up and hauled into prison um, for stealing all this money for so many years. But um, since America is kind of built on corruption and and it seems to be pretty much widely accepted now, um, there's not a whole lot can be done. But it, right now we have the OFF Act that's been introduced, and it's called Opportunities for Fairness in Farming. And the people who introduced it are Mike Lee and Rand Paul, two of the most right 
I guess, conservative uh, guys in the Senate, and then the two most liberal, Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren. And that is the four. I think uh, there's a Gillibrand on it also, and those are the people who introduced it. And some guys have had a problem with it. Well, I don't want anything Elizabeth Warren's for, but if something is a good enough idea that both um, of the far sides agree on it, I don't see why that's a bad thing. Um, and the bill, what it does is it just gets rid of lobbyists. It does not, there's nothing about getting rid of the checkoff, which is what some people would say. It keeps the checkoff, but it takes all the lobbyists' money out of it. And if you look at the contractors, even in the $14 million that that doesn't go to the NCBA, they're all lobbyists except for uh, the checkoff beef board. Um, the checkoff beef board actually gives themselves, to go back a little bit, the checkoff beef board gives themselves $1.8 million for producer communication. Um, and what they do with that is they tell producers what a wonderful job the checkoff does and how they need to keep paying, you know, how it's a great program and they it needs to keep going. And so they have $1.8 million that they're they're sending out information to producers and they're buying ads in magazines. And I've, if you follow my YouTube, I've went through all that um, where they really just control ag media with that money. But then you go back to um, that Northeast beef promotion. They I watched a video where they talked to the chair of the beef board and his name was Jimmy Taylor. I think he's out of Oklahoma and he seemed like a good old boy, but um, they asked him what the, what the checkoff does. And he talked about this Northeast beef promotion, which doesn't even get 1% of the money. Um, but it seems like a good program and it's something you can talk about and, and tell, tell all your members what a great program it is. But the fact is that it, they don't give it any money. Um, and the other thing is that it's a, that that program is ran by the Meat Import Council. Now, what is the going back to the lobbyists? Why would the Meat Import Council need to be in on the Northeast Beef Promotion? Why wouldn't that go to like say New York State Beef Council, which New York State has a beef council, um, or or something like that? Well, the reason. These are all lobbyists that are partnered with NCBA. Like you look at the 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 second biggest um, money amount goes to the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Um, these are you know, and like you look at the Meat Import Council, the Export Federation. These are partnered with NCBA on most political um, issues, including North American Meat Institute. That's a pure um, beef packer lobbyist organization. That is what they are. And so when something like a mandatory country of origin labeling bill comes out, uh, NCBA has all their partners that they've partnered with on the checkoff and that are going to fight with them and make sure that that never happens. Um, and so the plan is to get all the lobbyists um, out of out of the checkoff, and that's what the Off Act is. And there's 131 farm and food groups that have come out for it, and some of them are kind of nutty. Um, and so, you know, to me, that's that's the talking point against it. Um, Colin Woodall is the CEO of NCBA, and he is a complete and total scumbag. Um, if you think of slime ball DC lobbyist, that's that's kind of who I think of there, and how he operates. And every person who has come out for the Off Act, like Mike Lee, he wrote an op-ed and he pushed it out to Mike Lee's home newspaper or biggest newspaper in his state of Utah, the Salt Lake Tribune or whatever it's called. And he talked about how Mike Lee has now partnered with uh, animal rights activists because there are some animal rights activists on this deal that um, that are signed on to this off act. But um, if you read the bill, which Colin Woodall, in, his, in these op-eds, he doesn't say anything about the bill or if there's anything in the bill about animal rights, because there isn't if you read it. Um, but what he does is he just tries to smear anyone who, would, who goes along with it. Um, he did it to another House of Rep somebody in the house of reps i can't even remember the guy's name i don't think i'd ever even heard of him but anybody who comes out for this bill 
he's going to write an op-ed and t- say you're an animal rights activist. He did the same thing back when they were trying to fix the cattle market, and, and these groups got together that wanted to take away power from the beef industry or the beef packers and the corporations. These are just people who want to take the corporate power out of the food industry. And um, so if you if they sign on to any idea that you have, then you're instantly t- partnered up with animal rights activists. Um, and so as far as partnering up with animal rights activists, if NCBA wants to talk about it, their two biggest clients, Tyson Foods and Cargill, have both literally partnered up and invested in animal rights activists. Tyson Foods invested in Beyond Meat, which was PETA's company of the year. Um, Cargill has, both Tyson and Cargill are invested in this lab meat crap, which is put together by people whose main goal is to end, their stated goal was to end the slaughter of animals um, by creating all this lab meat. Um, And when those... When those partnerships happened, um, Colin Woodall did not write any op-eds and and inform people of what was going on um, because those people are his partners, Tyson and Cargill. And the North American Meat Institute, who is his partner in the checkoff, checkoff dollars go to the North American Meat Institute. Just recently, you've heard lab meat has become approved by the USDA. That is in part because North American Meat Institute is lobbying for these lab meat companies the reason they're doing it is because they represent uh, Tyson Foods and Cargill, and they are investors in the lab meat companies. Um, and so you could say the beef checkoff is partnered with an animal rights activist. North American Meat Institute is lobbying directly for those companies. Um, and so what we are up against as far as trying to get that thing through is really – it, it's a tough one because all, you know, like in my state, your state affiliation, you know, Chuck Grassley is on our ag committee. And there, if he wants to know anything about cattle, he goes to the state affiliate of NCBA, which is Iowa Cattlemen's. And um, so he's not signed on and it'll be a tough task to get him to. Um, Nebraska, Deb Fisher is actually an NCBA member, you know, the senator there. Um in Kansas, you can really forget about anything because they are all in. They're, that's uh, that's the headquarters of Beef Packer corporate and corporate cattle feeders. Um, and so it's tough. It's it, it seems like it'd be tough, but if you tell your senators, um, give them this information. I'm going to have all this information on the website. I'm going to try to put all this into an, an article or or a web. You know, something you can scroll through, and I'm going to try to have the charts and everything up there. I'm not the best at that kind of stuff, but I'm going to see if I can. And and you just send them the podcast. Um, hopefully it's good enough <laughs> that you could share it. Um, I never know how these things are going to turn out. but And really share this podcast. Get the information out there. What What I really want is for people to be informed on this subject, because right now it seems like when you bring it up, there's so many people who are misinformed, and like I said, there have been years. I wrote something about this uh, a while back after the NCBA convention, and I had somebody comment on my on Facebook about how NCBA is great, and I should I should never criticize them. And they went on to explain how they have been to every NCBA convention, and they went they were in their coll- collegiate program and all this stuff, like NCBA has these years and years where they've really just kind of brainwashed people into thinking they're a great organization um, without really showing what they're actually doing. Um, and so it's tough. It's tough. But if you ha- if you know somebody that raises cattle, they're paying into this checkoff. It's it co- it's coming out every check when they're selling it. And so share the, share the information with them. Get them to maybe open their eyes a little bit. Um, and at the start of this, I, I talked about how this is kind of almost like a true crime podcast. Um, I said it was a story of fraud and corruption and manipulation, and, and I really believe it is. But but after going through all this and talking to the people who've been involved, it's it's really just a sad story. Um, once you, There's been a lot of people who, or a number of people who have really fought hard for 20, 30 years of trying to fix this thing. And when you talk to them, 
um, they just sound exhausted. Um, and some of them have just literally just told me, uh, you know, they have said they, they're given up. There's no more point. They've, they've done everything they can. This thing has, there's been lawsuits. It's went to the Supreme court. You know, there's been petitions and what you're up against every single time is an $80 million lobbyist group. Um, and, and it's like, they're a lobbying machine, you know, they know how to, you know, it's a bunch of farmers and ranchers trying to get together to stop this thing. But like, this is their job. This is what they do is they push through this crap and they, tr- they stop anyone who wants to stop them. Um, but I feel like, um, it's getting harder and harder to kind of hide the truth, I think, in this. And that's what what I'm pushing for with this um, with this podcast. I feel like with the rise in independent media and social media, um, it, it's getting harder to hide the truth. And it, the goal here for me is just to get more and more of that truth out there. Because from what I have been told, that... Uh, the truth will set you free. And so I guess we'll see.